Welcome back everyone. Next up is a workshop on automation in software development lifecycle by Karan MV, who's a senior manager, international developer relations at GitHub. This workshop will cover the understandings of SDLC and where automation makes the most sense. We will also discuss the importance of code scanning in SDLC from a security perspective and also explore open source tooling available for code scanning. And we'll also have hands-on workshop using multiple code scanning tools for multiple programming languages. We now invite Karan from GitHub to conduct this workshop. Hi, welcome Karan. Hi, Tricha. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Uh, it's great to be here. All right. So, All right. yeah, I'm going to quickly share my screen. Yes. Yes, please. All right. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it is very much visible. OK, great. Um, all right, I hope my audio, video, everything is good to go. Um, great, so thanks, thanks everyone for uh, joining in. Uh, there's, there's quite some stuff that I'd uh, love to chat about and then share with you on automation, security, and uh, a whole lot of things uh, in the next one hour. So meanwhile, while I'm going through this interactive uh, workshop, feel free to write in any questions that you have in the Q&A section. Um, so that I can take it up as and when it comes in or probably towards the end as well. Uh, but feel free to keep the questions uh, coming along. All right, so um, let me bring up. Um, okay, great. All right. So, of course, something that you know I also mentioned about uh, automation in SDLC. But uh, before we get started, a little bit brief background uh, about uh, me, like how uh, Richa introduced. I'm Karan, uh, and I'm a senior manager for international uh, DevRel uh, here at GitHub. And uh, you know, basically, what I do is I um, help developers of all skill levels and work with communities, organizations, uh, enterprises, and pretty much. Um, wherever a developer is uh, in uh, various different aspects of uh, open source, of software development, productivity, and things like that. Um, and I'm very, very passionate and close to uh, cloud DevOps and open source. And when I'm not working, when I'm not doing any of these things, you can find me you know, reading a lot of books uh, and also a little bit of acting, anchoring, filmmaking, and things like that, and the creative side of things. Um, and you can reach me on at MV Karan on all of the social uh, networks. So before before we get started, uh, you know, just to just so that I can help make this session very much more relevant to you, um, I have a couple of uh, quick polls that I want to share, which is going to come up on your screen right now. Um, so, all right. So if you can take uh, you know a minute to just let me know how much of or do you really use automation um, in your day-to-day -day development work? So I'm not talking of uh, you know automation in home, home automation, even though that's something that I'm really very interested about. Uh, but I'm curious to know whether you use in your development um, development work as as anything, you know, not just uh, not just in coding, but probably in planning or anything else. So I'll just give you know another ten seconds. Uh, so you can quickly answer this poll. All right. Uh, thanks for that. Um, there's quite some responses over there and looks like it's it's a mix of people who do use automation and who don't or who are not sure. Um, okay, so coming up next is one other quick poll around security. So if you can again take a minute to answer that um, on how much of a security aspect do you really incorporate in your development? 
Um, so it could be, you know, uh, thinking about security from the first or want to incorporate or you're not sure, you don't have a say in it or it's just for the security teams to look after, et cetera. So uh, quite, a, quite a few options over there uh, based on, um, based on how you can tackle things. So I'm going to give it uh, probably another 10 seconds more for all of you to share your thoughts. All right, so great. So again, it looks like there's a majority of them who do think about security, but again, quite a large percentage of people who either want to incorporate but don't know how or you know leave it to the security teams or not sure etc so um so that's good you know i think we have a good uh, mix of audience here today on uh, various of these aspects so uh feel free to feel free to drop in any questions or you know if you want me to go slow or fast etc so anyhow let's uh, let's dive right into uh, to the content for today. So I have quite a few things that I'm going to cover about uh, the automation aspects in your development lifecycle uh, and also how you can incorporate security and then also you know, show you a few uh, demos on how this can be done and how it you know can be used in a very, very simple setting as well as a complex setting as well. Okay. All right. So I you know the first thing uh, whenever I say about uh, SDLC, um, I think I think many of you might uh, might not think like this anymore. But probably the first thing when I say SDLC for many people, this is what comes to mind. You know, where uh, there are developers who are coding and then you know uh, they build something and then just hand it off uh, to testing teams and QA or specific engineers who are specialized in it and then you know, who do the testing and then pass it on to the release teams, pass it on then, you know, to someone who operates it previously, the IT teams. Now it's probably someone else, et cetera, right? And at every point in time, there are handoffs. Uh, and many, many organizations and many teams also somehow in a way kind of work in a similar manner, uh, surprisingly, but now. The challenge with this is that, you know, there's a whole lot of manual effort that happens, you know, throughout this uh, throughout this process, right? From uh, the developers to the uh, people who are operating the code. And the challenge, of course, is that, you know, manual tasks are very, very significant inhibitor to just developer productivity. So you want to, you want to really empower developer productivity, right? You want to empower developers, but anytime, you know, a developer needs to perform a manual task, so the context switching takes so much of time, you know, uh, and then kicking off a workflow or doing whatever it's needed. And they're kind of being distracted from the work they as well as you want them to be doing, which is essentially development, right? But rather they get distracted with a whole lot of other manual tasks. And not to forget that this can also become a large human security risk as well, right? So like how I said, your developers is just, you know, kind of just worried about all of these other things. And the impact isn't just the time lost in the moment, but it's also, according to a recent study, it takes almost 23 minutes to get back into a state of flow, uh, you know, which is the optimal creative state when uh, all of us developers or whoever are highly focused and most productive uh, when they are interrupted, right? So it's 23 minutes is a large time, right? So just, just imagine you're working on uh, a certain feature or a bug fix, et cetera, and then you have to do some certain manual tasks, say for provisioning a test environment or something like that, and then come back to you know your uh, development part. It, it takes you almost a half an hour to just get back into flow. And if you compound that every time manual tasks are happening, that becomes a huge problem, right? Which is why, in a way, right, I like to, I like to, say that it's uh, it's a good thing that sometimes you know we developers are a little bit lazy and then somehow like to automate stuff as well right so we developers like automation uh, but here what i'm what i really want to emphasize is automation when it comes to you know the manual tasks that you're doing and also as a team as an organization 
right? Because you can be as uh, fast as your slowest, uh, you know, member doing manual task, right? So, uh, and this, of course, you know, when you're thinking about all of this, one term definitely uh, comes to your mind, which is the rise of DevOps, right? Um, definitely, this is something which would come in where, uh, you know, a Dev focuses on delivering new features for the base and, you know, ops want really the stability of the product. So, so the focuses are different, right? And uh, um, that is why DevOps as a practice, as a culture, as a set of tools, as a set of methods and everything else came into play. So, you know, I'm, I'm first going to give you like, the textbook definition of what is this DevOps really, right? It's basically a set of conventions and practices that create a main thing, a collaborative and communicative environment and a partnership between the development and operation groups. Yeah. So a very, very textbook, you know, definition where right from what a dev does and what, you know, an ops person does uh, is towards similar objectives rather than something very, very different. And, uh, you know, what started off as developers starting to do something and then, you know, handing it off to operators, essentially uh, over the past, uh, you know, decade or so kind of became into a DevOps practice and a culture where everything is super well integrated and everyone is looking at a similar objective right from the beginning. Yeah. And uh, surprisingly, again, uh, it kind of, this cartoon always, you know, showed some of my thoughts of, uh, you know, DevOps, right? When uh, someone, someone, you know, senior comes across and says they hired a DevOps and then, you know, uh, having a new organizational entity between development and operation teams will kind of, you think that it's going to help things, but then you soon realize that, you know, you need a DevOps on the dev side of things and you need an ops on the, you know, ops side of things. And then, you know, you'll start realizing, oh, you need a dev DevOps and then, you know, a DevOps ops kind of thing. It's, it's, it's not really about that. It was, you know, to me at least, or most of you folks who might be practicing, it's a lot around, um, you know, automation and automation that would help solve the dev and the ops communication issues as well, right? So again, anyone who went through this part, of course, came out with uh, battle scars and realizing that culture change is hard, right? So, which is why I like to think of largely DevOps as fundamentally a communication issue, you know? So how should really dev and ops communicate and how can we remove the middlemen and how can we make this more better culturally integrated and you might be thinking that hey you know I'm, I'm just a dev or an architect or you know an engineering manager or something like that so why do i really have to care about something that's left to upper management or senior management but if you think about it you are solving very very similar issues even in your code an example how do microservices communicate Right. So there's, there are communication issues that I'm sure you're tackling, even when it comes to uh, your own code, your own development. And there are so many issues when it comes to not just microservice communications, but also things like communicating between developer teams. Right. And uh, uh, think of it as microserver teams, right, uh, where there is there needs to be very good communication for your whole service to work as a whole. So back to you know, back to what I was talking about, right, is when you're kind of thinking about what parts do you really automate, you know, you think about, well, probably the first thing that you can automate is just the build part, right? So what's what's really the logical uh, next step? Um, and, uh, you know, you think about, okay, what if we automated deployments? Or what if we made it so easy to deploy to prod that all that needed to be done was a single button click by an engineer and you know before long when you think about it there is you know what we all know now as the CICD framework right where uh, right from the starting uh, you know right from when someone does a commit or there's a change uh, there was there'll be a build that will get triggered a build that's going to happen and you're going to get a notification of a build outcome you run some tests against the build notify what's the test outcome and deliver the build to the uh, environment and then deploy wherever necessary, right? So this is where a whole lot of layers start coming in and where, you know, right from your commit change until, you know, your test outcomes uh, was being called as your continuous integration. 
and uh, you know when you start your delivery to the build including that phases uh, became the continuous delivery and then you know when you kind of went a further step and even deployed it right from the whole workflow of the commit change you know it became your continuous deployment right so um i think you know many of you might have might have already thought about some of these things or probably even practicing you know a whole lot of these things right but what i essentially want to call out is that this is the ci cd part is something that most of you might be already kind of working with or practice practicing in some way right but when you think about it there are multiple other aspects of your development itself right uh, if you look at your devops cycle there is right from plan to code to build test release deploy operate and monitor right so how often have you thought about really what can you automate in these other parts right build test is probably the most common automated right but what about the others so i want to first give you a few examples around this um, and some ideas to let you think about your use cases of what you can automate when it comes to all of these right so starting right from the first part right planning so probably you have tickets or you know issues or project boards or whatever you're using for your planning right have you thought about automation over there right so probably um you want to have an automation wherein a new ticket gets created for a certain bug fix right so how does that get routed to the right team um how does how do you enforce uh slas or slos against the responses or resolutions for those tickets for the developers in that planning phase right so how do you go about that so how do you go about you know just really deciding which feature needs to ship to which product or which release at what time and then you know kind of have more automation around notifications around that or you know kind of reviews around that right so it's something that is uh, probably done more on um on the other aspects you know you might think that hey you know this is probably something for my project manager or program manager to do and things like that but how often do you think about um other things right um similarly you know kind of going to um yes absolutely you know manikandan gives an example defining the correct category and you know kind of a sub category while raising the ticket and things like that right so it's 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 efficient automation and use of time when uh, you're thinking about the planning phase um so similarly when you go to the code phase of course you know you can think about um say you know closing in issues with a pr or kind of auto labeling it and helping it group it right so think about the use case where um where a developer is raising a pull request and hasn't really added any metadata right so wherever they are kind of raising a pull request there's no metadata there's just the files which are there right how do you identify it how do you get it across in front of the right reviewers how do you know the objectives of these prs do you know if it has any performance changes that the pr is affecting and then labeling it accordingly or kind of routing it for proper approvals etc right so again a whole lot of things that can be automated when it comes to the phase of development uh, itself and the next thing of course many of us know the the most common build part where you know you go ahead with a whole lot of compiling and building and storing artifacts etc for the code Uh, I'm not going to go much in detail on this one because I think this is something that most of you might already be uh, practicing. Similarly, on the test part, um, where you know you kind of automate a whole lot of the test suites and linters, and then code scanning, and then you know just consuming a lot of the packages and everything else. So I think I think you know most of us do this part pretty well of the build and the test uh, automation. um and there's again you know other parts as well like the release part right so again if you are using um any any good uh, ci cd tool right so to some extent this handles that also for you uh, of publishing a specific release and you know uploading all of the artifacts and things like that right um and again there is the deploy part right so most of them of course do the ci part that is 
up to your test suite properly um and then also think about uh, the delivery part that is you know your release part and getting it into the right environment but from what i've seen very few of them are very comfortable even automating the deploy part of the uh, application of rolling it out you know to the necessary um uh, necessary environments or servers or serverless or kubernetes or wherever you know you're kind of really deploying your application right so that is also something you know that you can think about of what can be automated and in bringing uh, you know time down again over there um so again so what this was right for the most part automation really helps a lot right and you know i think most of the time in a typical scenario you're able to automate the build and the testing and also probably even the deploy part right um and a lot of the you know the testing can be automated etc but often if you look at this and all the pipeline that i really showed you there was really one key part that's missing that was the security aspect right if you noticed it the security aspect within this whole pipeline was something that's missing right and and the reality is that you know most of them over here um uh, or any developer etc we would somehow have a fear of the security teams right and uh, i have in fact heard you know many devs say that you know last people that i want to talk to is the security teams right because they can they can essentially you know kill a whole lot of the things that uh, happens or kind of really highlight a lot of security issues and then you know be like you know like i didn't expect that right so so the thing is that you know the security testing happened at a really bad time or right kind of before deploying uh, deploying to uh, prod and which really meant that if there were security issues right you need to figure out whether it was high enough to uh stop deployment or uh you know you kind of really need to uh think about whether this puts at odds between security and the business and you know whether you need to make decisions that should never have really come about right so this is typically you know the case what would happen when um when probably you don't have a whole lot happening in the early phase of your uh development uh, itself right so that's when that's what i'm mentioning about where you know the security testing comes in just at the end you know at the pre pod for the same um so there's a question you know the thresholds for the same i'm going to be talking about uh that in a while as well so what essentially all of this um came about uh is creating this whole divide between developers and security right where initially we were really thinking about um thinking about the the divide between developers and the operations team um but then you know i realized that there is a divide between developers and security as well and the focuses were different so developers wanted to really code new features whereas um security was the team that kind of in a way blocked these things from happening right um so so think about this right so what is really true what what do security teams really want yeah so they really want you to push out more code of course they are not there to block any business need um and they want you to update your dependencies and keep it up to date uh, and they want to make sure your you know your code is secure so what this again like how garo really uh, pointed out here in the chat is that it started creating this silos between the dev and the sec and the ops right um that the focuses have been you know very different so if you look at the first part a dev who really thinks about the code and the test and the ci and the deploy part um the objective was really to deliver features on time and on budget um and then comes security who really want to assure the security and the compliance part um in that pre prod uh, phase and then finally you have your ops folks who really want to kind of have everything uh, running reliably right and it's very very less folks who really practice proper flows to have this uh, done in fact it's it's only less than probably 1% of organizations today who are able to scan their code on every commit um and in fact you know according uh, to the recent state of application security report um it's 74% of companies scan their code less than 6 times a year 
to really know what's happening, right? And majority of developers are not really trained to code securely uh, at all. So just, just take a moment to reflect back at the back of your mind. What does your workflow look like today? And do you see some projects get stuck in the deploy state because of security? And you know, are you considering how you would fix some of these parts, right? So in fact, a very surprising thing is that more than 53% of breaches are caused by weaknesses in application. You know, it could be due to other reasons as well, you know, like human error or social attack or phishing or blackmail, et cetera. But majority is due to weaknesses in the applications. And um, and again, these numbers uh, do not even include other costly incidents that may become breaches like DOS attacks or, you know, um, exploiting vulnerabilities within applications or anything like that, right? So essentially, if you, if you take a step back and see what was really happening, um, instead of you thinking that, okay, you know, my developers are going to write all of the code from scratch and from the beginning, the reality that's happening is that your code is being depended on or kind of using dependencies of multiple other packages being written by so many other developers worldwide, right? Um, and then, you know, if you think about it and if you look at uh, the numbers, um, almost 80 to 90% of code in new application comes from open source. So it's really, really vital to kind of really secure your dependencies and use tools that can manage your modern software supply uh, uh, software software supply chains. Right? So if you just look at the numbers, right, it's kind of 570x more developers than you know security uh, researchers uh, itself. Uh, and yes, of course, kind of the log4j type uh, issues and uh, how much impact it can have. So I want to give an example over here, not the log4j example, but um, just to give you an understanding of the scale. So if you look at TensorFlow, right, and how really a lot of the dependencies flow through, um, you look at around 2,000 direct contributors, 7,000 third degree contributors, and when you come all the way down, there's more than 23,000 seventh degree contributors to TensorFlow. That means the number of contributors two dependencies, two dependencies, two dependencies, et cetera, right? So if you look at, you know, why you really need to think about this, it means that collectively all developers in a way who are kind of either contributing back to open source or kind of consuming open source packages in some or the other way have some of these dependencies and this extent to which you are thinking about. So what it really means is that when, you, when you're thinking about your uh, project, it's no more about uh, you know my code, the developers that I mean the code that your developers have written or we all have written, etc. But it's also about are you securing your supply chain because one vulnerable package within your dependencies could again lead to impact of your whole project, right? And like how you know rightly pointed out over here, this is where you know DevSecOps uh, comes into play. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, the term was coined long ago itself, um, but it kind of expands more on the DevOps principle with the fundamental uh, principle that security should not be an afterthought, you know. So security encompasses your whole DevOps part. Um, and again, yes, you know, some of them kind of want to call it as sec DevOps or DevSecOps or, you know, any anything you know that you're comfortable with, but essentially the concept is that security should be a part of each and every life cycle, if possible, again automated. And to give you an example, right? And this is a very very real example. Um, I want to share with you on how much of an impact and effect something as simple as probably code scanning can have. Yeah. So all of you, I think would. would be surely tuned into some of uh, uh, the happenings around the um, the NASA Mars project and things like that, right? So a few years ago, the Mars Curiosity mission was launched after you know kind of years of development, and the JPL actually discovered a mission critical bug while the mission was in flight, you know, which would have likely prevented the capsules, you know, parachutes from opening and kind of safely uh, landing it. 
So at, at that time, right, uh, interestingly, the security research team at GitHub itself uh, were able to come in and then analyze the project using a very, very basic query to kind of look at the out of bounds in an array and kind of multiple other issues which would have caused all emission catastrophic failure. So it was something, you know, similar to what it's shown. It's, of course, not, you know, the exact same code, but just a representation of how you can see that uh, something like, uh, you know, uh, out of bounds could uh, could occur, leading to an issue with the project, right? So uh, a very, very simple example. You know, I think most of us probably could have come across this at some point in time. Right and uh, but but fortunately the team at JPL were able to patch the bugs using an over the air update on the fly literally like while the mission was on route to Mars yeah so it it was a success but very very high stakes involved so just think about it the the project cost was estimated to be around you know two and a half billion dollars right and uh, if this had failed it would have been a very very big catastrophic failure so. So this kind of gives you an idea of why integrating security right from the beginning, right within your STLC is super critical. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, and of course it would mean that, you know, the more code that you have, you'll have more technical debt and exposure. So software really runs the world today and it's inevitable that we'll have more code, right? So, um, so what this means is that there is more increased exposure. Uh, in fact, if you look at it, the, the flaws in applications like how I mentioned uh, are consistently the number one attack vector for uh, breaches. So again, there is kind of two, two ways that you can look at measuring this. Uh, two key factors for success. One is you know the mean time to remediate, which is called excuse me, MTTR, and also the fix rates for vulnerabilities. So again, think about a moment uh, and think about how do you really measure success for you know application security for your team or you know, for your organization uh, right now. So essentially, you know, the complete DevSecOps should be something that's one developer first. You know, you can't think about it only from a security team uh, perspective. It it needs to begin at just the PR level. Right where uh, there will be checks and everything else that happens right from when it's being uh, developed, and you know it should be native, uh, both in terms of culturally to how people do, in terms of tool sets, in terms of the way people work, and a whole lot of things. It should it should not be an afterthought. Um, and lastly, again, it should be as much as possible automated. All right. Um, so what this essentially leads to is a term which many of you probably might have heard of is shifting security left, all right? And if you look at what these remediation costs include is a breach that happens, you know, after production could probably cost you millions of dollars in remediation compared to, you know, almost like an average of $80 that could happen right when, uh, you know, at your development stage when when a developer does a uh, push or something like that right um and that's the reason why everyone really wants to shift uh, security left and bring it more closer and closer to development rather than um having it as an afterthought so uh so really the fundamental thing what i'm trying to convey is to embed security in your developer workflow and I really love the uh, you know cartoon that I want to show with this. Um, and if any of you uh, you know want to try it out, uh, well, please don't. Is this right? Uh, wherein the last thing that you would want to have is naming uh, or having your son be named as Robert Drop Table Students. You know, uh, so kind of really embedding. Uh, the, it's, it's it's kind of funny, but it's also very very realistic, right? So. You'll be surprised how many applications still don't sanitize, you know, inputs uh, before sending it off to the database, and as a result, uh, to some extent, kind of uh, come across situations like these. So there are, of course, multiple uh, multiple ways that you can you can think about of uh, embedding security at the pre-commit stage, at the commit stage, the deploy stage, and also the operator and monitor stage. 
So I'll quickly go through briefly some of these things before you know I get into a demo and then show you some of these things in play. Um, so the first thing is, of course, pre-commit, right? Before you even kind of, to an extent, work on coding and committing, think about threat modeling. What does the threat surface really look like and uh, understand it? Uh, and also making sure that, you know, whatever IDs you're using have proper security plugin. And if there are things that you can do much more beforehand, having your pre-commit hooks in it, ensure that there is, uh, you know, secure coding standards that everyone is aware of and having kind of uh, peer reviews right in the pre-commit stage or pre-push stage to be, you know, technically accurate. Uh, but a large part, of course, that I encourage you to think about is in the commit stage, right? Think about static code analysis. It could be SAS, you know, which is the static analysis tools, or it could be even TAS, the dynamic analysis tools, etc. But think about, you know, at least static code analysis. Security unit tests, right? So most of them might have, you know, of course, unit tests and things like that for your code. But is there a possibility that you can also have unit tests specifically for the security aspects? Uh, have dependency management, you know, and scanning the dependencies for all vulnerabilities and credential scanning. Again, most important. Uh, when you commit, uh, by mistake, if you kind of uh, leak it out in a commit, right, and you, and probably if you forgot about it, you at least want to be warned. Uh, if not, if you haven't already done it in a pre commit hook, you at least want to be warned after committing that, hey, you committed a credential, right? So that you can kind of wipe it out, reverse the PR, sanitize your repo, and all of those things, right? Um, and then, of course, in your deploy phase, again, is something that, again, many people don't think about. For example, IAC. If you're using infrastructure as code for all of your provisioning and things like that, is there a way that, for example, someone can then, you know, go in if they get malicious access to it? Can they go ahead and spin up hundreds and thousands of servers, uh, you know, using your IAC code? So can you have some checks on it? Um, can you have security scanning on as a part of your provisioning process uh, or, you know, cloud configuration and accept and test and things like that, right? So, so think about, you know, what all can happen even at the deploy phase and how you can really embed this as a part of your developer workflow itself. Uh, and then again, when, when it comes to the, operating and the monitoring part, um, there is also make sure that there is continuous monitoring and remember to have feedback loop, okay? So an example is that, you know, if you're using any of the say, static code analysis tools um, and there was something that was discovered uh, later on after the code has been committed, will you be able to trace that back to the specific commit, the specific PR and the specific PR author and the reviewers to highlight to them that, hey, the code that you had committed, which was fine then, but has a you know vulnerability right now needs to be fixed, right? So having some of those automations as well, um, both in the operating and monitoring phase to close that loop uh, is gonna be super helpful. And then, of course, having threat intelligence and blameless postmortem. So, you know, it's one of the things which I come across very, very often. Uh, people think postmortems are to kind of really figure out who to point fingers at, but it's more about kind of doing an RCA, not against a person, but against what was the specific issue culturally, technologically, or a decision that led to, you know, uh, any incident, et cetera. Right. So, even after production deployments are done, uh, you need to kind of keep monitoring for threats and thinking about uh, what all you need to take into account, right? Uh, so with that, you know, I'm going to kind of uh, quickly jump into the next 10-15 uh, minutes uh, to show you a couple of examples uh, with uh, a few open source tools on how you can uh, accomplish uh, a few of these things in, in a very, very light way and how it really helps you um, kind of get going quickly. So I'm gonna um, switch my screens now. Um, but bef while I do that, if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, please feel free to put them um, in the chat or in the, or the Q&A window. Um, and I'm taking a look at it right now. All right, so let me 
um, bring up my screen. All right, so just as a heads up, you know, I'm doing this um, demo live. So uh, in case something goes wrong, please bear with me. Um, and I can you know, kind of uh, walk you through some of that. So let me bring up my screen share and, okay. So I'll try my best to make sure whatever I do is visible. I'm gonna go to a maximum zoom extent possible over here, but um, I think you can double click to view in full screen. So what I'm going to start off with is just by creating a simple, you know, repository for the demo. So I'm going to just call it as, uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, more of a, uh, a Ruby and a Rails developer. I love that. So I'm going to just show you an example in Rails uh, with uh, Ruby, but, um, but, you know, some of these is really applicable uh, within, you know, within, within any language as well. So I'm just going to call it as a security demo. Uh, public, so you can kind of take a look at it whenever you need it. And um, just gonna do an MIT license and create a repository. So I'm gonna start off with just a plain repository and a plain project. And um, uh, I'm gonna bring up my environment for this. Um, so it's going to take uh, a few seconds. So by the way, this is a cloud uh, development environment called uh, GitHub Codespace. Um, so I can, you know, without really doing a lot of the clone and the checkout, I can do everything uh, right within a browser and an ID with, uh, with a VM behind it. So I'm going to just uh, use that. Okay, so I have this up and running. I'm going to gonna increase this as well. Um, and I hope you're able to see it. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly bring up a Rails app. Uh, install Rails. Uh, it's gonna take a few seconds to do that. Okay, there it is. And I'm gonna create a new, um, create a new Rails app with the simple command rails new. Um, yep. Right, don't really care much for it. Now it's just fetching a few dependencies. You can see, you know, a whole lot of dependencies. Um, and there it is, okay. So I'm just gonna again, Uh, commit all of these things, all right? No pre-commit hooks. There is nothing that happens. It just is a plain push, all right? So I'm just gonna say initialize rails and I'm doing, gonna do a git push. Okay. So I'll come back over here and take a look. So I have this pushed and ready, okay? Now, um, I'll give you an example with a specific static code analysis tool for Rails called as Breakman, okay? So what Breakman is, is it's a, uh, again, like how I mentioned, it's a static code uh, analysis tool. Uh, it's a vulnerability scanner specifically for, you know, Rails and kind of really looks at the application code, uh, et cetera. And, you know, it's, uh, it's open source, you know, so you can kind of go take a look at what it does and, you know, everything else as well. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, I won't be installing this within my application, but rather I want some of this testing to happen when there are pushes or when there are, you know, PRs that happen, etc. So I'm going to create a workflow for this um, to do that. So I'm just going to go into the security tab and set up a code scanning. Okay. Um, and I'm just gonna say I want some other scanning tools and I'm gonna, so there are a lot of these tools, you know, uh, open source as well as kind of, okay, here is Brickman. 
So I'm just going to say configure uh, Breakman. So this does, you know, multiple uh, steps. So it kind of triggers based on um, branches. So basically this is, you know, GitHub Actions workflow uh, that can be used for uh, security scanning. Um, so it checks out your repo, it sets up Ruby, it installs Breakman, and then it does a scan. And then, you know, it uploads the serif files uh, for you to take a look. All right, the, basically the output. Uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead and um, commit it as it is uh, to the main branch. Uh, and just to ensure I don't get more problems here, I'm gonna pull these changes again back here. Okay, so if I go into the actions right now, I can see that you know this breakman scan has got started because when I created this file, essentially there was a push that happened. Okay, so because of this push, uh, there is a scan that's being run, all right? So this was against a commit. And um, if I take a look at the scan that's happening, um, it did all of these steps, all right? And uh, what you can notice is that the scan ran successfully, but if I just go and look at the scan step, um, it completed with an exit code of three, all right? And a report was saved in output.serif.json, uh, right? So I can, you know, probably take a look at it. If I go back into the security tab, you can see one badge and one alert over here, all right? So if I take a look at this alert, there is one alert over there which says this specific dependency Lufa is vulnerable with this CVE. So I need to really upgrade the version. Now, the reason why I showed you this is because if you think about it, I just started with a plain new Rails application, absolutely nothing, all right? But even then, there are some vulnerabilities, okay? And some uh, dependency issues, all right? So don't assume that just because, you know, you're starting fresh out of the box with something that it's corrected. Uh, there are reasons probably why it's still included as a part of the upstream uh, project, whatever it is, but from your perspective, it's always really helpful to run a scan even on fresh out of the box projects to make sure that uh, you know you don't have any issues. All right. Um, so this is this is one um, you know example. So so if, if you click on more info, there is more details about the CVE as well, and you know kind of uh, what it does, etc. All right. Um, so before I kind of put in some real code and vulnerability and show you how it probably can fail, I want to show you one other um, scanning uh, tool, right? Or rather checks. So um, one of the other tools is called, or rather as OpenSSF, uh, sorry, scorecard, okay? So this is, uh, you know, by the open source, uh, Security Foundation, not it right? open source software, uh, open SSF, open source security foundation. Uh, and it's kind of, you know, a foundation which brings together a lot of players from the industry uh, towards open source uh, security. All right. So they have a project called uh, the scorecard, uh, which actually helps with you with the security health metrics for open source. So it does a lot of real uh, checks against an open source project and, you know, really reports back on um, multiple things. All right, so there's the scorecards check, which are what all it does, and you know, kind of detailed checks and things like that on any open source uh, project. All right, so let's go ahead and you know, kind of run that as well. Um, so I'm gonna go back again over here and say, add a scanning tool, uh, and then I'm gonna search for the open SSF one. Um, and there it is by the Open Source Security Foundation called. OSSF scorecards, okay? So I think um, there must be some uh, documentation uh, for it as well. So I'm gonna just um, search for it um, in the marketplace. Okay, here it is, yeah. So there are some installation instructions where you know kind of need to create a pad, uh, a personal access token. So public repos can be accessed for uh, you know, the scanning and then, you know, kind of, you kind of set up the workflows. All right. So I'm going to just go configure that uh, workflow. 
And again, if you look at it, there are multiple things it does. It does a scorecard analysis. It checks out the code. It runs an analysis. Again, this is an open source project, which you can go take a look to see what all checks it does, et cetera. And then, you know, it does uh, use a token for uh, some of the scanning as well. So I'm going to go ahead and um, before I do this, I just need to configure a token for it so that um, it's able to um, access uh, this public repo. So I'm going to add a repository secret. I think it's called scorecard uh, read token. That's right. And I'm going to paste in um, the access token. So don't worry about the security aspects of showing you all the access token. I'm going to invalidate it after the demo. Uh, so I'm going to go back uh, to this. And I will quickly uncomment this repo token. And I am going to, uh, OK, there it is, scorecard read token. And I'm going to commit it. All right. So again, I'm saving it to the main branch, not creating a PR, just to show you quickly how this is also going to trigger uh, some scans. So you can see, um, because of this commit, the breakman scan also got triggered. Uh, and then you know the supply chain security, which is the scorecards scan, also got uh, triggered. Okay. So I'm going to take a look at uh, take a look at that uh, quickly, um, and then see you know what it's working on. So it's uh, doing some builds and uh, everything else. Um, looks like a Docker image. So quite some builds, and then you know it's pulling in all of the data. And uh, OK, that was quick, 31 seconds. My scan is done. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to again go back into security and then see if there's any alerts that this has reported. You can see there's a lot of high alerts and medium alerts and other alerts that it resurfaced. You know? So for example, you know, if you look into code review, it says that um, there was no reviews found for some of these commits, all right? And it gives you some more details on how you remediate it as well. So look, so these are all, you know, really things that are not really related to the specific language that you're using, but more about the overall health uh, itself when it comes to open source. For example, branch protection, there's no branch protection, which means kind of really anyone can push into main, just like how I did, right? So, um, there are quite these things, again, by the OpenSSF scorecards, which can help you uh, really look into uh, a whole lot of these things as well. Um, so I'd have loved to you know, show you one other uh, demo, probably, if time permits, um, by actually introducing a vulnerability in um, Rails and uh, then showing you whether it catches. Um, I'm not sure on whether we have um, time for it. Uh, but I'm going to take a pause and then see if you have any questions. Um, if not, I'm going to take another two minutes to quickly show that demo. So any any questions so far? I don't see anything in the chat window or um, the Q&A window. Oh, sorry. So I, I do see a few chats. I was, sorry, uh, sorting it in the wrong order. So. Is Codespace available for enterprise version of GitHub? Yes, uh, it's available uh, in the enterprise version of GitHub. Um, can you suggest some uh, plugin slash tools for uh, C Sharp shop? I, I, I'm thinking you mean for C Sharp. So you can, you know, you can really go take a look at uh, uh, take a look at multiple other open source tools that could be there. You know, I'm not specific. Uh, or I don't know specifically of any of the C sharp uh, tools that could be used. Um, what is error return code uh, three? Well, that I have to check really in the Breakman uh, documentation. What uh, the return code three is? Probably you know it somewhere does uh, define, but it's related to Breakman um, and not related to you know what it is. So it depends you know really on what a specific um, tool is returning for you. For example, you know you can always configure your workflow such that if there's any other exit code other than zero, it should fail, which should be the use case typically. 
but it depends on the tool. So the exit code three is really of the tool. Um, any suggestion for uh, embedded firmware bug identification? So I think by um, embedded firmware, you're I'm I'm not really sure. You know, I think again there are a whole lot of tools uh, which are specific to a language, specific to a framework, specific to multi. Uh, but again, you know, one of the things is if you're not sure, you know, based on uh, your repository, you can just go into the security part and then see multiple other scanning tools that you can, you know, you can add. Uh, there's CodeQL, and then you know there's uh, Sonar Cloud, and then there is so many other, you know, which are there for multiple multiple languages and multiple frameworks. So there's Rubocop, for example, for static code linting that we use at uh, GitHub as well. There's ES linting for your ECMAScript, JavaScript, and for Node.js. So there's multiple tools that are there. Um, so there's one, again, for C++ code analysis and things like that. So uh, you can go take a look at it. Um, all right, so there's how can these GitHub hooks be integrated with uh, IDE? So there are again, you know, multiple extensions that are uh, available as well. So what I showed you right now is actually GitHub Actions, which you know you can configure multiple uh, triggers based on which these workflows can uh, run. Uh, but you know you can have a trigger for a pre-commit or for uh, any other commit within uh, within the hook as well, based on your uh, code editor that you're using. Okay, so I see a whole lot of uh, uh, questions that are there. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know answer them uh, in chat now in a while since we are uh, running out of time a bit. Um, but uh, but again, you know, uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. Uh, I just want to leave with one last thing: is I want to show you um, uh, again a, a demo that I created beforehand itself. Uh, sorry. So if you just uh, go to uh, rail security, so this is open source. You know, you can go take a look at this quick demo. What I had done previously was I just wantedly introduced a um, error within um, you know a small controller which actually lists all of the directories and things like that, uh, which is which should be have caught by a, a static analysis scanner. And if I just go into my security, right, uh, for this different repo, it actually caught it um, and then told me that, hey, there is a possible command injection. And why the hell are you kind of really listing based on whatever parameters you need and things like that, right? So uh, that's just a small example that I wanted to show you that as soon as I did this commit, this was caught. And uh, you know it gave me a feedback loop that there's a possible injection that happened over that, right? So, um, that's all. That's all that I had, um, you know, for uh, for now. So uh, thank you, thank you, everyone, for patiently tuning into this. And what I really recommend you is to think more deeply about automation and especially about how security can be a part of these workflows. So thank you, thank you to uh, NASCOM as well for this and uh, for the team uh, for bringing in uh, NATC. Uh, it's been great. A whole lot of questions. I'm going to hang around um, in the backstage for a while and answer all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karan. It was a really insightful and a powerful session. Um, as you rightly said, you can, you know, while you are backstage, you can answer all the queries in the Q&A tab and in the chat box as well. Okay, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Stay tuned for two more minutes for the next workshop.